This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air. Welcome to What's News Dunedin, the radio show that spawned from the 15,000 plus strong local Otipoti Dunedin What's News Dunedin Facebook group. The group that's been putting the social back in the social media since 2020 with respectful adult debate and a sense of humour. I'm your host, Richard Knights. On today's show, we'll be talking to our wonderful guest, John Marable from Living World Disability Resource Centre, who will be telling us a bit more about themselves and what they do, as well as helping us look back across the posts that have generated the most interactions in the past seven days in the What's News Dunedin Facebook group. Uh, those three posts this week are the rainbow crossing in Auckland that was painted over, vandalised by members of Destiny Church, uh, restored to its full rainbow glory, which is fantastic. Um, a post on the group about Kmart in Dunedin, according to a friend of the show, Amy Taylor, not being able to to enforce their mobility parking spaces outside their store, which is probably quite topical um, for, for John. And the Dunedin driver that live-streamed their night of crazy driving with their child in the car. Welcome, John. Thank you very much, Richard. It's good to have you here, mate. Um, before we get started on the important stuff of the show, we're going to just do three pop questions. Now, those pop questions will tell my listener exactly everything they need to know about you, John the person, right? That's, that's scary. Yeah, absolutely. So um, there's, there's no right or wrong answers unless you get this stuff wrong, okay? So cream teas, you know, where you have a scone, you have jam. Cream on top. So jam first. Yes. See, I didn't have to get through the question. No. That's, that, mate, that's the right way to do it. Thank yeah, you. Totally. We'll, 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 we'll take that one as a win for you. Thank you. Uh, and a win for the show. Um, now, second question. Who's your favourite Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtle? That would be Michelangelo comes to my... Yeah, Michelangelo is definitely one of them. And I'm just trying to remember what his weapons are. Is it the... Oh, don't ask. Look, if I get that wrong, my wife will kill me, okay. right? So like, let's just pretend you never asked that question. Okay. And, I... we'll, and, and, we, and we'll look it up. We'll Google it later. Yes. Yeah. So Michelangelo. Michelangelo, yes. good answer. There's, nothing, there's no wrong answers with the turtles. Yeah. So now the third one, third question, listen carefully to this one. Would you rather your pet be able to speak to you but not understand what you're saying or your pet to understand every word you say but not be able to speak? The second one. So you want to understand what you're saying? Yes. Like Lassie? Yes. Because Lassie could understand everything yep. you said. Uh, and then, you know, and then, but not worry about them talking back. Exactly. See, I'd go the other way. Yeah. I'd go the other way because I'd, I'd love to know what's going on in my dog's head. I, I think my dogs used to look at me and I knew what they wanted just through the psycho, but they... They're, they're, they're amazing things, aren't they, pets? Because they've got personalities, and, and the best thing about them is they, they, they tell you stuff, like with their eyes. So if, mm. if my dog thinks he's done something wrong, and he rarely does, I just know it. he's looking at me with these kind of like, what did I do, Dad? And I'm kind of going like, no, you, I haven't told you off. But he's like looking at me kind of going like, I'm look, he's, looking, he's looking bashful, you know? How a dog looks bashful, I've got no idea. But I'm seeing I'm picking it up. I'm, I'm, whatever he's laying down, I'm picking up. I taught one of my dogs to ring a bell when it wanted to go outside. And it was great because we'd sit down, have tea. He'd go up, ring the bell. My wife would get up, just open the door, and Jessie would back up <laughs> onto her plate of food. Oh, wait. that is clever. See, they're, they're smart animals. Oh, definitely. Yeah. We've got a cat that thinks she's a dog. Yeah. Yeah, because she hangs around with my Rotty all the oh, time. Nice. Um, and then, yeah, it's like, it's, and, and, he, and he thinks he's a lap dog, even though he's like 50 kgs. So, um, Bloody crazy stuff. Anyway, let's move on to, um, to talk about the topics of the week. Now, um, first one is the, the Rainbow Crossing in, in Auckland. Um, and this is one of these one of these ones that always – it always baffles me that people can be so upset by bright colours, you know, because I, I love bright colours. I don't care if it's a rainbow. I don't care if it's, a, you, know, a, you know, pink and white or yellow and green. Mm-hmm. It doesn't make no difference to me. But there's a certain part of society that gets extremely upset by – bright colours. Yeah. And obviously you had the whole Destiny's Church members had sort of whitewashed that, um, that, that thing in, I think it was in K Road, I think. Um, and it's now been put back to its glory. Um, and, and wonderfully, ironically and fantastically sort of like karma um, driven, paid for by the fines that Destiny's Church has raised in order to support their person that's gone on which is which I think I think's bloody I think I, I think, think that, I think that's the best part karma. of it. Yeah, karma can well and truly delivered itself. Yeah. But yeah, even on the group the other day, we've still got people kind of getting upset about and I I consider our group to be quite more well, extremely inclusive, very diverse. There's still the occasional person that's kind of going um that's wrong. 
and you're kind of going, I don't, what, what's wrong? You're saying, like, you're saying you love everyone, is, is that wrong? I, do, I don't get that. You know, what's, it, what, what's, your, what's your thoughts? I think it's sad when people have to get – so I don't even know if passionate's the right word because if it turns to being destructive, to me it's the wrong type of passion. Um, I think we are all the same, but we're all different. We should respect everyone's difference. doesn't matter where you're from, what you are, whether you're able or disabled or whatever. We're all individuals, and I believe that we should – Respect everyone's individuality. Exactly, and 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 the bit that the bit that I find the most hypocritical of these of the people that are getting upset about it is that they would very much want you to treat them as they are. Yeah. In fact, they're demanding it from you. In fact, they're demanding that actually not only do you treat them as what they are, that everyone should be treated like them. And and I, I find I just that, that's the bit where I scratch my head and kind of go, actually, like what. Where's your, where's your self-awareness in this? Because actually you're, you're demanding something from somebody that you're not willing to give back yourself. Yeah, and that's it. Yeah, and, that's, and, that's, and, that's, and that's madness to me. I mean, and that's the thing. I could understand from someone who's neurodiverse, neurodiverse if the colours or the combinations or whatever were a stimulant over sensory um, you know, and they couldn't uh, walk on the crossing. I do know that the Wakari Hospital put a cross in down. They actually painted it and it was almost 3D-ish and it looked like you were stepping over planks or someone who's neurodiverse was struggling, someone with dementia was struggling. So I can understand that type of thing, but from yeah. my understanding, the rainbow crossing didn't give that effect. It wasn't too contrasting or anything. And yeah, These aren't the people that are complaining, are they? No. You, can't, you can't say they actually understand that. You're un- you're upset because they're actually saying actually um, we, we support our our rainbow community our, yes. and, and we're trying to be inclusive. You know, it doesn't matter. I mean, to me, that is when when someone walks across that right, whether they be straight, lesbian, gay, whatever, anywhere within the spectrum of our wonderful rainbow far now, it's saying I love you. That that yeah. that piece of ground is basically saying I love you. I don't care who you are, and 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 not just about rainbow community. Everyone walks across this piece of ground. I love you. How can that be a bad thing? It's not, and I think that's where that section of society who painted them out, they're the ones we should question. Yeah, yeah. and but they're also from that strange sort of religious side of things where, where apparently everyone loves everyone apart from if you're different to me. And, yeah. and, I'd, and I'd, again, I really struggle with that mentality and some people hide behind their, hide their bigotry behind their religion yeah. some people use their religion to bring their big, bigotry out to the fore um, I'm, I'm Roman Catholic I'm, you know, so I, I was brought up with the Christian church right? Um, I don't go to church anymore I have a different way of having a, a different method for sort of understanding what I believe to be my yes. faith but, but I've never used the church as an excuse for bad opinion no. you know? and, and, but there's amazing how many people do I mean that's all Excuse me. <clears throat> um, almost a little segue, possibly to another question or topic later. But I see the disabled sector doing the same thing. Some people are hiding behind their disability, believing they can be rude to non-disabled if something's not quite right. You know, I think it's the human nature that some people fall into that trap of. Um, and I think it's easy to as well. So yeah. let's move on to um, something which actually is probably quite relevant for, um, and, and you know, just happened to land the way it's landed this week with the news. But um, Amy Taylor, who you may or may not know, yeah. um, friend of the show, had her on before, um, and tried to get a park at the new Kmart store in Dunedin, and the mobility parks were all taken. And there's a, I could go on for an hour about the, the sort of the, the privilege of people in parking in Dunedin because it just blows my mind. I've come from a part of the world where, you know, people don't expect to get a park anywhere because actually it's, it's so busy that yeah. it's impossible. But in Dunedin, there's this expectation I can park right outside the door. Um, it's, there's a space for me always, and I, and, I, and I deserve it. But they had mobility parks that were taken by, by, by what appeared to be people that didn't have the, the mobility pass, you know, the permit, yeah. et cetera. And they wouldn't speak to the the, st- the the staff in Kmart, who were, by all accounts, lovely, but basically said they weren't able to enforce that those spaces. Yeah. Which, when when you consider the other news that's come out this week about the new sort of seven hundred and fifty dollar fine for you know misuse of a mobility parking space, which I think is an absolutely fantastic idea because actually they're there for a reason. Yeah. Um, I find it a little bit strange that 
someone that's got their own parking spaces doesn't have the wherewithal to manage them. Yeah, I mean, that's the thing that um, I do know that some private companies will monitor the car parks for private businesses. Um, in the UK, it's actually got the picture of the permit holder on it, which actually is really good. And it's got a little time as well saying, I'm going to be in this car park for 15, 20 minutes. It would be good if we could get something like that, but it's still going to have people who are going to abuse it. Um, I I know Amy, we have a lot to do with each other, three different organisations, so I'll have a chat to her and then I might take it up with um, Kmart. Um, I did a little... Um, article for the star a few years back just pointing out if your business is not accessible how much money you're losing so for example um i go in there offer except amy might go there with her children so she's going to be buying a, a fair bit if she can't go in there they've just lost out say 40 50 dollars yeah um and then also the bad press Mm. So I might think, well, stuff it, I'm not going to go there if they can't um, monitor their car park. So it's really the awareness of the shop owner, the business owners, that they've got to monitor these parks or have a contract with Wilson Parking or whoever. But it's interesting, the number of times I will see a um, food delivery van parking in a accessible car park to, just to drop stuff off. Mm. Um TVNZ. Am I allowed to say TVNZ? Oh, you said it. It's too oh, late. bummer. It's, it's, we'll it's, blank it's, it out. It's out in the world. It's, yeah. it's, it's live radio, John. Like, at the mm. end of the day, mate, we, 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 we fly by the seat of our pants, so you That's say good. what you want. Just please don't swear. All right. Yeah. I'll try not to. I'm from Essex. <laughs> well, exactly. So yes. am I. Like yeah. we could, this could end up. This could end up being awful. But we'll yeah. we'll, we'll, we'll try and rein it in. Eh? Yeah. So this could be your last program. <laughs> I've just made. I've made it just over a year. That's good. Just made right. it over a year. And if I, if this is the one that takes me off air, well, you yeah. just so be it. Yeah. But no, um, TVNZ last night they mentioned. Yeah, they they got a little survey. How many people have um, incorrectly abused the um, mobility parking? 12% of people put their hand up and said, I have. Um, interestingly, the one of the biggest abuse of, of Mobility Park are the permit holders themselves because on the back of the permit it says only to be displaced when you are exiting the vehicle, always to that effect. The number of people who will pull up, oh, Richard, can you just run into that shop and get me whatever? So they're actually abusing it because... It, it's supposed to be that they, the permit holder, get out of the car. Right. I, I didn't yeah. realise that. That's, that's actually something some, something new. Yeah. I, and I can, I can say hand on heart that I've never once parked in a mobility space. No. Um, and I wouldn't because I, you know, I firmly believe that they have a purpose, right? Yeah. So that doesn't mean I haven't occasionally parked in the, you know, the, the five-minute authorised park for, you know, for someone else if I'm dropping someone off. Yeah, yeah, we've, we've all done those kind of things. But, yeah. but, but mobility parks, I think, are, you, we need to stay away from those because – because not only, and again, this is something that people don't potentially realise, is not only are they for a specific purpose, they're bigger spaces, so they allow for, you know, the the car, the vehicle that might have a, a ramp or a, a lift at the back or, a, you know, the roof rack type arrangement to get wheelchairs in and out and, and give space to the sides and to the, rears of, to the rear of vehicles as well. And that's why they're so important, because it, be, it might be okay that someone could, as a in um, a mobility park and go and park in another space they can't get out the damn car no. you know and that's the thing that unfortunately what you said was correct 24 years ago that they were wider however the vehicles have got wider now and um, you actually need three metres room for the person to get their hoist or ramp out the back and then the turning circle so one and a half for the ramp or the um, hoist and then 1500 for the turning circle, and that's the same for the side if it's a side mountain ramp or a hoist. Right. So all of a sudden, you're getting people the vehicle of choice that ACC will issue for people who have to travel in their wheelchair. Overseas, it's called a wheelchair accessible vehicle or WAV for short. Um, the vehicle of choice for ACC is a Mercedes Sprinter. That is about six metres long. Wow. The standard car park is only five metres long. And as you said, you might have the painted chevron at the rear to, to stop people from parking too close. But, um, yeah, so all of a sudden you really need a park that's nine metres long and over five metres wide at least. Um, 
But if you've got a side-mounted vehicle, you really need to park in a parallel park and then you can get out on the pavement. Yeah. Um, if you try and do a, a ankle park on 90 90% of the parks are no good for someone with a side-mounted ramp or hoist. Fair enough. And, um, then, and, and, then, and then you've got some people like Sean Plunkett from the bloody platform on Twitter yesterday coming out and saying something along the lines of, like, he, he ran a poll, right? And the man's an abhorrent individual as far as I'm concerned, but he ran a poll about whether disabled people should then be charged for using a normal space. And I'm just looking at that kind of going, like, like I know that shock jock sort of stuff. I know that's like... Get me some clicks. Get me, get me some angry people because because like, no one talks to me otherwise. Yeah. But but Sean, really, I mean, it's like you you you've got a responsibility to be a, a, at least pretend to be a human being, right? Surely. I've heard. I've actually been. I had someone say that to me once. They parked in a park, and I jokingly says, "Oh, you're disabled now. What's happened? Well, you park in my parks. Why can't I park in yours?" I said, "Well, my park is a little bit bigger." Then, and as you said, it allows me to get my wheelchair out, blah, blah, blah. Um, I've, I'm smiling because I've got a photo of the car parks in New World where someone has parked on the painted chevrons between the two wow. accessible. And, I mean, there are people out there which don't seem to be able to engage their brain. No, yeah. and that's unfortunate. It's you know? very sad. So that might be their disability. Well, uh, well yeah, absolutely, but they, they, I don't think they would probably have a claim to be disabled. So, yeah. um, but maybe that's but maybe that's where they're going with it. Something that we are hoping will happen is that initially the parks used to be called power parks, short for paraplegic, because the paraplegic movement and CCS were the main drivers, and it was wider. But now, of course, um, everyone with an ingrown toenail can get the a park in permit. As long as you've got the medical certificate of it, that's a standard joke among us. Ah, uh, fair enough. Yeah. That's all right. Um, I didn't know whether to laugh or to be, or, or to oh, be confused. Please. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> no, it's just standard joke because there is not enough accessible car parks around there. But what we'd like to see is maybe a wheelchair symbol for the wheelchair car parks, and then some other symbol, maybe a, a, a the um, ambient person or someone with crutches or something, denoting that is for someone who can walk or has got a heart condition or whatever. Um, there was an organisation called the uh, Hidden Disability Sunflower Lanyard started in the UK so that people with um, a hidden disability um, wear the lanyard or a badge or something that can be identified. And, for example, we're in New Zealand or one of the people in New Zealand and um, that badge or the lanyard just lets the staff know that that person's got a hidden disability, they may need some assistance or may need a little bit of time. The hidden sunflower have got a whole lot of different symbols, wheelchair, stand in, someone with a heart and all this type of thing. And we're saying, let's see if there's a way we could take one or two and have three different car parks, for example, wheelchair car park. Well, actually in America, they have the wave car parks, which are bigger. If I pull up into it and I've just got a standard car even though I'm a permit holder I will get ticketed because I haven't got a, a, a huge vehicle yeah, yeah, that needs that extra yeah. extra space so I mean there's lots of things overseas that are starting to happen and happen. Dunedin City Council are starting to look at bigger parks longer parks and we've got a couple around city on their website they've actually got a map of where the accessible mobility parks are and they've also got different colours for the ones that are bigger, longer so they're starting to take it on board, even though it's not legislation. And uh, that's encouraging. Mm. And, because, and, and, and I saw, in the, I'm moving across to another story, I saw in the news yesterday before that they, they've, they've got three Kayangora houses have stopped, just come up in, in Port Chalmers, um, which are universal design and wheelchair accessible. And we, we, we just need to be doing more of that, Definitely. you know, because cause the other side of things is, like, if I look at my house, right, I, I've got no need for any kind of accessibility, right, because I can get up the steps, I can get around the deck in. But at some point, I might not be able to. I, I don't know what I don't know what tomorrow brings, you know. No. Um, but if my house had been designed in a way that was wheelchair accessible and universal design, I could not have to worry about well, if something happens to me, am I going to be able to live in my house, or do, do I suddenly have to move, pick up everything I love from a place that I love, and actually, you know, do something different? So, yeah. so we, we need to. Be, it's good to see council doing more and more of that, and it always upsets me when I, when I see people pu- sort of pushing back against it because they just don't know that they that tomorrow they could need those things. Because exactly. it, it could happen as quickly as that, right? Yeah. 
Yeah, and that's the thing that um, a lot of people with my job, because I'm access consultant, they will contact me saying, look, John, we're looking at how can we future-proof our house. If you're building a new house, it's great. You can just put extra studs or drawings in so that you know where they are for later if you need to put a um, handrail in or things like that. Make the bathroom a little bit bigger. So you've got that... Interesting, 1500 was the old, the universal design recommends an 1800 turn and circle because people are getting bigger, disabled people are getting bigger. Scaringly, I saw a power wheelchair, electric powered wheelchair, that um, two physios were sitting side by side in it. Wow. It was that wide. And, um, and there are people that big out there, which is sad. So... I'm thinking of a relative in England. He hasn't been able to get into the kitchen or um, upstairs because he's conditioned. He, he, and the wheelchair they've given him is a bariatric and they've made, had to take the door off and the door frame off so he can get into the kitchen in his wheelchair because it's that big. Right. If it had been future-proofed when it was built, you know, no problem. No, Exactly. And I mentioned about the building code being 24 years old for accessibility. The recommended and the standard only has to be 760 mils wide for a door when it's open. That's not wide enough now for a lot of wheelchairs. No, it's so, not crazy. Um, we would like to think that um, every house which is built, they start looking at how can we make it bigger. And the um, British, the UK have got standards. Interestingly, it's only... The one I was looking at the other day is only enforceable in England. So if you live in Wales or Scotland or Northern Ireland, it's not enforceable at the moment. But the um, building code covers both residential and commercial, whereas the New Zealand standard for accessibility only relates to commercial vehicle, uh, commercial vehicles, commercial buildings. Right. Yeah. Right enough. We'll probably talk about that for now. Oh, I'll tell you we but, could. Sorry, but, but that's all right. Let's move on to the third and final. And it was the... It was the crazy thing about the Dunedin driver that live-streamed their journey of avoiding police. And they got caught because they were live-streaming it. Um, they had the child in the car. They had someone else in the car with them. They were, they, and then they started – they might have started in Omaru, but they finished in somewhere down in Cavisham Way. Mm. Now, there's a couple of things that jump out for me on this particular story. One is that there's just that inherent danger of, of hurting someone other than yourself, right? If you're going to – I mean, I've got a view. If you're going to go out and do something stupid, right – do it to yourself. Don't yeah. don't don't inflict that on someone else. But but the other bit was the in my mind was the media responsibility to not share that live stream, and they did. Mm. And in my mind, right, you bring in notoriety to something that actually there's no benefit. The only benefit is to the person that shouldn't be doing it in the first place because they get they they gain that notoriety. But I'm looking at that kind of going like, whilst there's a part of me that goes, oh, I'll be interested to see that. That goes away pretty quickly when you think, well, it's just an idiotic thing that I actually – it doesn't enhance my life to know about it, no. to, to see it in action. And all it does is give them popularity. I think, yeah, I think that's the thing that um, social media has a lot to answer for. I mean, growing up, you learnt consequences very quickly, um, whether it was uh, because you fell down that tree – or in my case, fell down that cliff I was climbing and ended up in a wheelchair, even though my parents said, don't go near that cliff. But you learn consequences. Don't touch that. It's hot. I told you not to. Um, I sort of feel that a lot of these people do these stupid, idiotic things because they don't understand about consequences. Um, and by being shown on social media or whatever, someone's going to think, oh, I want to try that. Bang, you know. Yeah, and, I, I begin, social media is one thing, but I, I think like I think like people like the ODT and and other people, I think uh, possibly stuff shared it as well. Is, is that sharing that as part of your news article is probably I think I'm you know I've been, I've, 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 I talk a lot about social responsibility of yeah. of media companies, um, and I don't think I, it's my view I don't think they should be doing that in that sense because actually it doesn't add anything to the what they're reporting. I get that they're reporting the story. But to to then be sort of pointing you straight back at the the life, yeah, you know, the, the, it, it just seems a little bit. They, it's like they've forgotten they've forgotten where their moral compass actually should yes. stop, and and they need to just kind of rein it back in a little bit. Yeah, I mean, I, sometimes on the news they forget to give that warning that has graphic 
Mm. Yeah, and I think there is a responsibility. I don't know what it is. My father always said that every time, every generation forgets twenty percent of the generation, what the generation before knew. So whether it's uh, social responsibility, consequence, I don't know. No, it's it's really, you know, it's irresponsible what the person did. Yeah, and the fact that he's got no to- notoriety now is, you know, not good. It's interesting that it was the, it was the fact he was live streaming it that was what, that was what got him caught. Mm. Because again, people don't realise like if you're doing stuff like that, you actually you know you basically you, you 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 letting people know exactly where you are, even though you're hiding. You're telling the public that you're hiding, and guess what? The police are part of that public, that you, and they now go, oh, he's just he's round the corner over there. Yeah. You know, which um shows a certain intelligence. I was, I was going to probably put it a little bit nicer than that, but I, I, I think you're right. It shows a lack of intelligence, I think, mm. um, in in that sense. And then, um, and someone said they were in A and E complaining they got bitten by the dog um, because they resisted the arrest. You know, and you kind of go like, well, what, what are you what are you expecting to happen at this point? Like, you know, if you if you get run away from police, right? We all know they've got police dogs. We all know that that police dog, if it finds you, is likely to not say stop, mate, because he has unlikely question at the beginning of the show. Can't speak. No, no. He's going to bite you because that's what he's trying to do. Don't complain at that point. Like you shouldn't have run. Uh, I just crack up the number of times I've heard of people who breaking the law have been injured and they are now getting compensation for their injury. You know, it's I know it's sad. It, it's a little bit. It's a little bit round the wrong way, isn't it? But it, you someone know. someone escaping from the prison breaks a leg and they get compensation. It doesn't doesn't make any sense, does it? No. it doesn't make any sense. Well. No. Moving on, I'd like to like to talk about you. That's why I've got you on the show, um, and want to understand a little bit about you, what you do, um, what your story is, how you, how you come to be where you are. Because as you we might alluded to earlier on, you're from Essex too. I'm yeah. from Essex. It's an Essex reunion going on on the What's News Dunedin radio show. So perhaps explain your story. And and, and again, you, you've obviously touched a little bit on how you became disabled. Yeah. So if you could just maybe give us a five minute John Marable. So give Please me the not. give me the cut when you want me to stop. Oh mate, you just you, you keep talking on it. If I if, just, I if I start talking over top of you, you know you've had enough. And when you leave the studio, I know exactly. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I'll just leave it running. We'll just I'll just you know, yeah. I'll, I'll go out when the time finishes. So, so yeah, I born and bred in England, Essex. Um, interestingly, uh, before my accident, which happened when I was nearly eleven, um, disability I never realised was part of my life because I had next door neighbour Robert was deaf and mute. Um, one of my aunts was blind, another relative had lost a leg in the war and things like that. But to me it was just Aunt Wynne, Robert or whoever, they weren't you know, disabled. About two weeks before my accident I saw someone in a wheelchair at my brother's school concert and I thought, hmm, imagine living your life you know, in a wheelchair, not realising within two weeks I would be in a wheelchair. I, um, we were on holiday up in Scotland and um, it had been raining all day. My brother and I and my sister were in the caravan, and my brother and I, we used to fight like brothers do. It stopped raining, and my parents said, right, outside, whatever you do, don't go near the cliff. So, of course, my brother and I thought we'd try and climb it. Unfortunately, when I was coming down the ledge I was on gave way, and I f- ended up slipping down and then hitting the, the uh, ledge my brother was on. I remember looking down, thinking, this is going to hurt. I've ruined my mum's holiday. Landed on the uh, rocks, and I said, my brother better go and get help. And then I'm lying on this um, the ground, mum's rubbing my leg, and then just lost all my feeling. Spent nine months in Stoke Mandeville Hospital, and that's really relevant at the moment because the um, spinal unit was actually founded, or um, one of the driving forces was Sir Ludwig Gutmann, a little German Jew who left Germany in '38 and started working at the spinal unit because up till about 1938, your life expectancy was just months. They didn't know what to do with you. So he said um, he would like to start working with the spinal cord injury patients and giving them some form of rehabilitation sport. So that's how the Paralympic sport started. And I actually met the man, fantastic, tiny little guy. He actually told me off. I was speeding in my wheelchair down the corridor. He walked out of an office and I nearly bowled him over. And an 11-year-old kid, it seems funny that the founder of Paraplegic Sports telling me to slow down. Um, the very first day I was allowed in my wheelchair for longer than an hour, I went into the archery hall and they 
taught me archery, following day table tennis, and the ethos from the spinal unit at the St Mandeville Hospital was the fitter you are, the healthier you'll be, the better quality of life you'll have. So that's sort of been my aim and my goal right from May, June, July, by August when I was in my wheelchair, August 1967, so we're talking about 57 years. And it is part of my life. I'm always doing some form of sport, some form of recreation. Um, I start sounding like Liam Neeson from Taken. Um, I was taught a whole lot of skills when I was in Stoke Mandeville Hospital, skills to make li- my life easier, because in those days the built environment was not wheelchair-friendly. So I learned skills to go down flights of stairs, up and down curbs, how to use escalators. And um, there's skills that you shouldn't have to use today, but you still have to because the built environment is still very unwheelchair friendly. And I was very happily... I wasn't allowed to emigrate until I could prove I could work, just something the New Zealand government does. So I got a job with the National... Sorry, I got a job with... NetWest in England, then came to New Zealand and worked for National Bank. Enjoyed life, really good banking. Um, the only disability stuff I was doing was the power sport. Took up downhill ski, ski racing, crashed big time, ripped my shoulder quite badly, and I had a lot of hassles with ACC wanting assistance. And I suddenly realised that there's a lot of people out there in the world who haven't got a strong voice and I thought well there's people out there who who are struggling so I started working for Disability Information Service as an information consultant and um, great and we were just giving out information could be anything from um, where to get assistance if you've got a stroke um, survivor in your family or you might have a child who's been diagnosed with spina bifida and this type of thing so we we're mainly an information provider. We've now changed our name to Living World Disability Resource Centre because we've expanded so much. We started off with two staff. We've now got something like four, and sometimes five with a part-timer who comes in occasionally. And we do everything from hire equipment, sell daily living aids that will help people live a full life as much as they can. Um, the biggest product we are selling is incontinence products because it's something that's not really um, provided in the healthcare. Um, I now specialise on the built environment with regards to accessibility. So I look at buildings with commercial buildings to see how they comply to the building codes and I provide information to public on how they can make their houses more accessible. I had someone the other day looking how they can make their two-storey house, wheelchair accessible, so I provide them details on various hoists to get them up the stairs or even a through the, through the ceiling hoist. There's so much equipment out there now, it's just fantastic. Unfortunately, you put disabled on... If you advertise something and it's in the disability field, the price seems to go up, which is quite sad. Right. Um, my job, I love it, um, because every day we're helping someone. They come into the shop... Or they might ring up and you give them a piece of information. It's like you've just given them the, the winning lotto ticket. You know, it's it's quite a. Do you give out winning lotto tickets too? Unfortunately, no. Um, I, I've got one here, but it's um, last week's one, and you could have it, but it's not a winning one. So. I'm, I'm I win all the time. You do? Yeah, like four bonus lines. Like oh. I'm I'm I am the king of getting bonus lines. Nice. Like genuinely. Like my wife says to me, "We're on the lottery." I'm like, "Yep." And she says, "How many bonus lines?" <laughs> Sometimes eight. Like yeah. bonus lines, like you know, it's not going to allow her to retire quite yet, which is what she's looking for. Um, but you know, she she can't say that I'm not winning. No, you know, so it's uh, it, it's but it's the game we play every week. So yeah. I'll, I'll win I'll win some more bonus lines on yeah. Saturday, almost guaranteed. Yeah. I, I think to myself, what the Lotto Commission does, you know, all the support it gives out there is really really good, and I know a lot of people who, because they're not ACC. Um, they have to go through the Ministry of Health. And unfortunately, my figures might be slightly wrong. If you are looking for vehicle assistance, you might get 22000 It's a one-off. So that's going to last you for the length of your disability. Not that your disability might suddenly be cured, but who knows. Um, 
So I know a friend who needed to get a hundred odd thousand for a wheelchair accessible van, and he went to Lotto, and you know, so Lotto does it. So for people like yourself and my and all the other people who never win, you are helping people yes, start to they're live, they're and it's some, really really good. They do some they do some fantastic causes. Yeah. So uh, are you as, as as the company you you know are living well? Are they um, are they Government funded? Are they? Or, or, or Partly, how to- yeah. So we've got the government does have a scheme at the moment called um, I want to say NASC, but that's some, something totally different. Um, it's providing information, so um, we get X amount of dollars, but the rest of the time, the manager at work is doing funding for application for so many different organisations, whether it be the. Um, Aetia Trust or whatever, there's so many different trusts out there that everyone can apply for, yeah. for assistance. So, yeah, the amount of money we get from the government is only about a third of what we need. Right. Um, and is that under is that under risk due to a lot of the changes that they seem to be making? There's, 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 in, in my mind, there seems to be a lot of punching down yes. on our vulnerable right yes. now from, from our government. And, and I can't understand why. Because because none of them none of them would actually put their hands up and say yeah we're being cruel to people but actually their their, their policies are punitive and, and and it's quite clear to see that they are so is 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 some of that funding at, at yeah. risk now because of yeah. because of changes that they're making it was renewed every three years at one stage I think when I started in the um, industry um, because we're not for profit that's sort of why we get this funding. Um, I think it was renewed every five years or reviewed and then every three and now every year. And that's always a question mark, is this contract going to be renewed? We're part of uh, New Zealand Federation of Disability Information Centres up in Auckland, um, Wellington, Company Coast. There's so many different ones in the country. And we're all starting to feel that little pinch. And um, we're just wondering what's going to happen with the government. Are they going to renew it? Are they going to renew it to the same level? Are they going to increase it? Are they going to decrease it? Um, there doesn't seem to be a lot of increasing no. going on in 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 this particular se- sector. We, we, I've had um, um, people I've had people come on from Fikaya, um and people like Amy, uh, your good self, um, and and generally the feeling is one of um, quite serious apprehension around what we're going to do because. Because the, the government, more than anything, and I've said this about n- numerous issues, that they they like to leave it to other people to deal with the stuff that they probably should be doing themselves. Yeah. It's easier to kind of go, well, someone who's kind-hearted will pick this up and do it because it's the right thing to do. Yeah. So we don't have to do it because actually a charity or a, another organisation is going to is going to fill the gap for us. But it shouldn't be like that no. in, in, in my mind. There, sh- it, there should be a strong feed of of funds from the very top to to the to these people because because they are extremely vulnerable because everything every, you just you take a disability and and in my mind I'm I'm very lucky I'm I'm I sit from a, a very privileged position but I could be disabled tomorrow you just you just don't know um but you go from you do anything as a disabled person and it's more time it takes longer it's more costly it, you know and and it, and it and it shouldn't be you know, it should we should, we should be given the opportunities, the same opportunities to everyone, regardless of whether you know I can get get across the room quicker than you. Maybe you can get a room across quicker than me actually in your, in your chair. But do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. It's like, it feels it feels very punitive. Yeah. That that you know being disabled is not only a problem for the person. You're then getting pushed down on by yeah the government too. And I mean that's the thing when people are needing care. I'm thinking of a friend of mine who needs to be have a support person get him up in the morning and put him at bed at night, and um, you know he actually is in bed by eight o'clock. I mean, I'm still training and doing stuff at eight o'clock. You know, so all of a sudden his active day is being reduced because of funding and things like that because there's not a lot of. Per- people providing the care support, for example. Wouldn't it be great to say, okay, Richard, I'm ready to go to bed, it's 11.30. But no, you know, you've got no one who's sort of work in that um, mm. area. I've got I, a, hadn't, I hadn't, yeah. like, genuinely hadn't given that kind of thing any consideration. Like, yeah. you know, But you're right, isn't it? It's like, you know, you're, 
you, you're going to be your life is going to revolve around the time frames of the services that can help you yeah. rather than actually what you need right we used to have a, a one of our six sense of humor jokes is disabled people don't go out at night a because if you needed support you were in bed by eight o'clock but if you're so like myself for example who can put myself to bed no problem um we would go to the pub. We might go to the pictures, then go to the pub. I would go to ring up a wheelchair taxi company and say, oh, look, uh, can I have a wheelchair van to take me from the Octagon? No, I'm sorry, we've got no wheelchair vans on service. Oh, OK. What time did he start? Oh, six o'clock. Because they do the school runs mm. and things like that. We have got a couple of other ones who will assist you, and there is a really good company out there who is filling that gap now. And he started so that he would work later. But you get a lot of um, the wheelchair vans do the taxi run, sorry, yeah, the, the school runs in the morning. So then you're only allowed to work X amount of hours a day. Right. So they finish at four o'clock. Bang. I first was aware of that when I stuffed my shoulder up. ACC said, right, John, we want you to continue what we're doing. So you're in rehab, but we will pay for the taxi to take you to keep doing your, your um basketball um, I was doing some coaching so I trained my basketball rang up oh, I'm sorry all well, the drivers are off how am I going to get up to Walkery I don't think my power chair is going to no and luckily I rang up with this uh, guy I know Bill Overston he, he was really the father of mobility vans in Dunedin he took the gamble and just started up pure mobility van service this was way back in the 70s late 70s um, he rang up, he said, John, no problem, I'll pick you up as a mate, I, yeah, which was really good. And um, I just then found what company would have a driver working after nine o'clock. Right. Yeah. But digress, but, it, but these are all the little things like I um, went to get a pair of shoes. Not that I wear them out, but I needed a new pair of shoes. And the hassle of having to try them on. I was in the shop for about half an hour. And I'm actually sweating because I had about three layers on, not realising it was such a beautiful day. Um, but I know other people who may not be able to lift their legs up and they'd be relying on someone else to take their shoe off, try this shoe on and blah, blah, blah. Yeah. Um, but to me, that is my life. You know, um, I once had someone who was born disabled say to me that I'm lucky because I could walk and where he's never had the experience to walk and I thought it was funny because to me he's a lucky person because he's, he has never walked so he doesn't know what it's like to run and jump and give your brother cheek and then leave him and yeah, yeah. leave him for dead yeah, yeah. Um, but I could see where he was coming from because I have had that and no one can ever take that from me one of the very first um, Paralympian females Eve Rimmer beautiful lady um, she wrote a book, Stand Between My Toes, and that's the one thing she can remember and miss, but still love the thought of walking through sand and getting that wet sand through your toes. Um, I know disabled people who've never walked, and yet when they dream, they walk. They're walking. It's, yeah. it's crazy, eh? Yeah. It's well, not crazy, it's like, you know, that's what dreams are for sometimes, mm. I guess, is to take you away from, from, from the realities. Yeah. Um, in, a, in my dreams, I haven't smoked for 20 years, but I always smoke in my dreams. And then yeah. I wake up, then I wake up in a panic thinking I bloody, they're so real, I wake up in a panic thinking I bloody, I've, I've had a cigarette on the sneaky. <laughs> and like, I'm, I'm, yeah. then, I'm then like, kind of going like, I can't believe it, I've got 20, I've got done 20 something years and I now, now I'm smoking. Yeah. No, I'm not, I just had a dream. So it's like, you know, that's, that's fantastic. Yeah. Um, so at 11, yeah. did, you, did you break your back? Yeah. Is, is that basically what happened? Yeah, so and then, landed on the the rocks, broke my back, but I split my head open and there was blood pouring down my face and I said to my brother, you better go and get help and this um, guy had seen me fall and he's got his hanky trying to stem the blood and um, on my Facebook page I've got a beautiful picture of a golf course and that is uh, where it happened in Dunbar in Scotland and I walked with him holding, trying to stem the blood from the cliff up onto the golf course and I'm lying there I can see my dad running down this dirt track. I'm thinking, hmm, dad better be careful because if he trips, he's going to hurt himself. Oh. And uh, I, I had no pain whatsoever. And um, as I said, my mum come along and she's busy rubbing my leg, saying, you, you'll be all right, John. 
And then I lost my feeling. I said, Mum, Luke's going to sleep. I want to get up and run around, like get the blood flowing. There's something wrong. And I just had to stay there. Ambulance came. Interestingly, 10 years ago, we were up in Scotland, and that's where I took the photo of the golf course and the cliff. And my brother was standing there, and this guy came up and said, oh, can I help you? And um, said, yeah, but I said, I had my accident here in 1967. And he goes, oh, and he walked off. And my brother said, I wonder if that's the greenkeeper who Dad threatened to smack because he was going on about the ambulance driving down the, the fairway and on the, the mm. green. But I don't know if it was, but he disappeared very quick. Um, yeah, he supposedly had to go at my dad. Oh, the ambulance shouldn't be on the green, blah, blah, blah. Yeah, yeah, it's, it's funny where people's priorities lie, isn't yeah, it? Like, genuinely, yeah. there's a kid that's hurt, like, you know, but don't don't put tire tracks on the grass, right? Yeah. So, but uh, I, I, I want to touch on something as well. That I, I, I read about you on, I think it's either your Facebook page or um, on the website. Um, you're also, you're a karate instructor. Yeah. And, yeah. You, and you do wheelchair self-defense. Yeah. Yeah. T- talk to me about that because, like, I, 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 you know, you look like a strong man. I wouldn't fight you, but tell me how did how? And I know you, by the sounds of it, you, it's just because you've always been active that you just kind of you know you've taken that mentality that you were given by the, by that guy yeah. and just said keep yourself fit, and then you've got the best opportunity to, to have the have the most fulfilling life yeah. in in your wheelchair. Unfortunately, yeah. that you could possibly have. But how do you suddenly get to how does how does self defence in a wheelchair? And, and, and I'm starting to already see. Why you might need to, but how does that? How does it? How do you? How do you get there? I originally liked the idea of the um, mind over matter. My father, he had been in the Royal Navy at the end of the war and travelled all around Asia, Australia, New Zealand, and he always used to talk about the um, martial arts and things like that, or the Chinese traditional medicine where you've got a sore hand so someone will stamp on your foot and he says you take your mind off yeah, it. yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so he he was he was very interested in my father very good comedian i used to have to walk up and down the hall with calipers and crutches and those days the calipers were metal and leather and really really heavy and i'd fall over and he'd come out with the t- paint brush and say oh john um, while you're down there just want to touch up the skirting board oh. um he said that I know I wouldn't be able to do a labourer's job, so I'd have to get a really strong, good education. And he always was saying, "Mind over matter. You need a strong will, strong, um, you know, that, and that get the confidence and things like that." And um, then Bruce Lee came along, and also David. Look at your house. Oh, if only, if only. Can you imagine? It'd be good. Bruce Lee's at the door. Yeah. I'll, 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 bring him in. Bring yeah. him in. Should, yeah. Teach me the one-inch punch. Yeah. I could. Do you want me? No, 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 no. I'm, I'm too scared. No, that's right. I'm too scared in case you're serious. <laughs> oh, I can't show you. It's good. But anyway, um, yeah, my, a friend of mine, his name was Gordon. We couldn't pronounce his Chinese name. He actually did Kung Fu, and we went along to um, watch Bruce Lee. And fantastic. And... Um, I thought, this is good. I love the mental side of it. I, and then David Carey in Kung Fu series. But no one would teach me karate in New Zealand. Sorry, sorry. No one would teach me karate in England because I was in a wheelchair. No one would teach me judo in England because I was in a wheelchair. No one would teach me Kung Fu because I was not Chinese. But my friend Gordon said, I'll teach you bits if you work in at the odd time for our, our fish and chip shop. So it was quite good. So I'd do that for a couple of hours and he would teach me a bit of Kung Fu. Um, one of the things when you break your back, you lose control of your bowels and your bladder. And I used to have to sit on the loo every other day for an hour to empty my bowels. So I'd be sitting there reading books on Kung Fu and karate and practicing all these moves. And, hey, oh, oh, oh. and my mum would be knocking on the door, what are you doing in there? I was just doing, you know, my, my, my bowels. What else? I'm practicing my karate and things. So I... I just loved the mind over matter. Unfortunately, before I left England, it didn't matter who you were, what you were, you were liable to get mugged. A friend of mine got smacked and got his jacket nicked off for the back of his wheelchair. Um, So I really thought it would be great just to be able to look after myself. Um, And it wasn't until I started, we came, emigrated in December 74 in New Zealand, 75, I started up the power sport here, which I'd been doing in England anyway. And then in 76, started doing Kyokushinkai Karate. And really, it's been part of my life ever since. I love being able to empower 
people, whether it be through my job or through my crowd or through meeting people. Um, after this, I'm going to Tahuna to do a self-defence class for the, some of the girls there. We do women's self-defence classes. I've been asked to do it for the boys at Tahuna as well, so it's something we're going to look at. Um, I always start off when I'm teaching self-defence, as I look at the person, I'm going to ask you this question. If I attack you, who's going to win? Well, I'm, You've I'm lost. Pre- I'm pretty certain you're going to win. Yeah. I, I'm, 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 I'm almost guaranteed on it. Yeah. And that's the wrong answer. <laughs> you have to have that willpower, the, the, the desire, the want, the understand that you are going to survive. Mm-hmm. Um, I talk about a switch. So the talk turn you into a, a mild real estate agent, into a um, fight machine. Oh, correct. Uh, just while we're talking about that, yes. I had, I've had a text from the wife, nunchuckers. Yes. Michelangelo. Yeah. We were close. It's, 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 it's always good to know she's listening. That's, that's, what, nice. that's what I'm telling you. If, if I get it wrong, I'm in trouble. I, um, nunchuckers are very good. I've got about three, four pairs at home. But the way I look at it is weapons can be taken off you. Mm. Um, so and used against you. Yeah. Um, so it's better to know how to take a weapon off of someone and then use it. But to me, um, weapons are, are no good. If you carry a weapon around with you, you've got the intent to use it. Um, and if the bad man goes to attack you, he's already got in his mind what he's going to do. Um, when I travel overseas, I have two wallets. I shouldn't tell people this because all the people now are going to say, give me both your wallets, John. Yeah. Um, so I'll have to go three. I but anyway, I don't think my wife will do that. Oh, she's, good. she's pretty much our only listener, so we're, oh, we're, we're, right, we're okay on that front. So I'll start teaching her some self defence and you as well, then maybe. To <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, the idea of the wallet is that if you are being mugged or someone wants your wallet, you hand them a wallet and it's just got a few dollars in it. It's got a couple of coffee cards and maybe an old credit card or something in it. The bad man or bad woman or bad person, whatever they recognise themselves as, they've now got what they believe is your wallet. While they're picking it up, because you don't hand it to them, you throw it about six feet away from you, and you're legging it. Um, so a lot of self-defence is mental attitude, um, knowing that if it does come to a physical confrontation, you have to decide what you're going to do, but it has to be 100% full speed, full power, no hold bars. Mm. Yeah, um, It's something that I love empowering people. Um, and that's because, again, going back, I learned all these skills for wheelchair skills. Um, there's so many people out there who need to know these skills and something that works, looking at doing a program to help people. One of the very first things when I was at school, I got a puncher, got home. This is my dad's sense of humour. He used to work nights, so he said, oh, what time's your mum home? I said, oh, she'll be home oh, about half an hour. Great. Go into the kitchen, get two dessert spoons. We're going to fix. I'll show you how to fix your puncher. And I looked at him. and He said, "The dessert spoon handles are the best tie levers you yeah, can get." Yeah, we used to do. We used to do bike repairs with, with, as a kid with, with two spoons. Yeah, and then you flick them in at the spokes, and then you and then you everything, yeah. and then you pop the whole thing round. Yeah, I remember. I remember yeah. doing that. As a, as Still a, the as best a, as a yeah. younger man. Yeah. So, um, which is which is fantastic. So, uh, you, we've got two minutes. I told you this would fly. Yes. Like, I just started a question: Is your self defence courses for able-bodied or disabled or both or everyone everyone yeah fantastic yeah um i have even taught people in electric wheelchairs with very limited arm movement what to do main thing is cover up protect your head and then you've got 160 kgs of wheels wheelchair to uh, the a run over the person then just make your way escape yeah, yeah, and and that's and that's and that's a, a a fair enough thing to do. To be completely fair, if some if some bugger's chosen to attack you, yeah. um, you know you get what you pay for. Exactly. Not, you get, so you get what you deserve, should I say? Yeah. If, and the thing is, if you hurt someone, you don't want them coming back saying, "Can you hurt me again, please?" No. Unless it's at my club, and I don't want to hurt you a hundred percent because you won't come back. <laughs> so I, I, I nicely hurt you. Oh, and I, and I think that. Is absolutely the perfect place to to round out the show, John. Yeah. It's like it's been an absolute fantastic Thank talking you. to you. I, I'm, I think we barely scratched the surface, so I'd, I'd like to think you'll come back and, and entertain us again um, at some point in the future. If you just sit there, thank you for joining us, and hope to see you on the show again uh, reasonably soon. Thank you. Cheers. All the best. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you.
Well, that's a wrap for this week. Thank you for tuning in. I've been Richard Knights, and you've all been wonderful. Remember, if you're looking for robust, respectful adult debate about all things local and further field and a welcoming online community that doesn't take itself too seriously, come and find the What's News Dunedin Facebook group and join our fun. On next week's show, we'll be talking to Gina Brown, Chair of Dunedin Heritage Light Rail Trust, and look forward to seeing you next Friday at 12 on All FM. If you wanted to listen to the show again or simply share it with your friends, you can find the podcast at oar .org.nz or even on Spotify and YouTube. This podcast was produced by ORFM Dunedin with support from New Zealand On the Air.